about failure. Hopefully it is a not, a, not a failure of a talk. So to begin with, uh, I want to uh, define some terms. What do we mean by failure? One way to look at failure is from the, uh, the design by contract uh, view of programming. Uh, this is the, the view of programming that was espoused by Bertrand Mayer. Uh, he kind of encoded it into a programming language called Eiffel. And this is relevant to us because Ruby's exception system is in many ways influenced by Eiffel. So in the, the design by contract view of software, every method has a contract. It may be an implicit contract or it may be an explicit contract, but it has a contract with its caller saying, uh, you will give me certain inputs, I will give you certain outputs. Failure is when code is unable to fulfill that contract. Uh, and this could happen for a number of reasons. The, uh, the, the code, the method could simply be called with invalid arguments. This is technically a failure of the caller, but it might be the method's job to report it. It could be a simple mistake in the code, like using a a string key when a, when a symbol key was expected. It might be a case that was simply uh, not planned for uh, when, when designing the software. Or it could be some failure in a system that's completely external to this software that it has no control over, like a, a web service returning a 500 error. I want to start off by just taking you on a whirlwind tour of Ruby's exception handling lifecycle, and uh, I'll go through some things you probably know, and maybe some things that you don't know. So it all starts uh, with raising an exception. Every exception starts with a call to raise uh, or to fail. Raise and fail are synonyms in Ruby. Uh, in recent years, raise I think has become more common, more commonly used than fail. But uh, I, was, I was discussing this with Jim Weirich, uh, and he has an interesting convention where uh, he actually uses fail primarily. So he uses fail to indicate a failure of the code. And then he only uses raise to, when he is re-raising an exception that he has previously rescued. So I kind of like this convention. I've started to use it a little bit more in my own code. Uh, raise with no arguments, equivalent to raising a, um, a runtime error. Uh, raising, we can raise, of course, with a string, which will raise a runtime error with that string as a message. We can raise uh, with an explicit error class. And uh, uh, we can also raise uh, with, a, we can supply another argument to customize the backtrace uh, when, we, uh, when we raise an exception. And this is useful when writing things like assertion methods, because we want that stack trace to point back to where the assertion failed, not where the assert method was defined. Now, something, uh, one thing uh, some people don't realize about raise in Ruby is that it is a method. It is not a keyword. So, um, and that means that like any method in Ruby, we can redefine it. So here's kind of a stupid example. Uh, well, we could make all exceptions instantly fatal. Uh, a possibly more useful uh, re-implementation of raise uh, is the hammer time jam that I wrote. Uh, so this attempts to be a list or or small talk style uh, exception or uh, error console for Ruby. So when an exception is raised, instead of just being just uh, unwinding the stack, it'll it'll instantly pop up a uh, interactive console asking you if you want to if you want to proceed, if you want to ignore the errors, if it never happened, if you want to debug uh, into the source and stuff like that. What does raise actually do? Well, it actually it turns out that raise breaks down into four steps. So it goes through uh, it, first it gets the exception object. Then it sets the backtrace. Uh, then it uh, sets the global error info variable, and finally it, uh, it it starts unwinding the call stack. Let's take a look at these in a little bit more detail. Uh, first of all, getting the exception object. When you look at the way raise is called, you might think that it's 
it's defined kind of like this first example where you say, uh, you know, you say raise an exception class in a message. So you think, okay, it's probably saying uh, that class dot new and then providing the, method, the message. Not actually what Ruby does. What Ruby does is it calls, whatever you give it, it calls the dot exception method on that object to get the exception object. And as it turns out, in Ruby, uh, this method is, is defined in two places. It's defined on the exception class, and it's defined on instances of the exception class. But just because Ruby only defines it in one place doesn't mean we can't define our own. Here's an example of that, uh, where we, we take uh, HTTP responses, and we give them the ability to turn themselves into exceptions uh, which could be, a, you know, could be customized, a customized exception for that particular type of response. And then it's a line code which, which can call, which can do an HTTP request, and then uh, it can decide whether it wants to, to raise that, re that response as an exception. And it doesn't have to explicitly call uh, anything to convert it into an exception because raise does that automatically. So you can kind of think of dot exception as similar to 2s or 2a or 2i. It's kind of like the coercion method to, uh, to coerce an object into an exception. Step two in raise is setting the uh, backtrace, which it does with the set backtrace method on, um, on exception. Step three, we, it sets the global error info variable. So this variable is, is spelled dollar bang out of the box, but if you require the English uh, library, then it's alias to the somewhat more readable error info global. This global always <coughs> contains the a reference to the currently active exception, if any. So what this piece of code demonstrates is that uh, prior to raising this, an exception, the error info variable is nil. During the raise of that exception, so when we've raised it and then we're, res we're, we're rescuing it, the uh, variable is the that variable is set to that exception, the exception that was raised, and then after we've handled the exception, after the end of the rescue block, then that uh, variable is nil once again. And step four uh, in raising an exception is to start a winding call stack, and uh, I'm not going to get into the technical details of that. <clears throat> once we've raised an exception, we handle it with rescue. Rescue with no arguments. Uh, rescue with no arguments will catch any exception, right? <laughs> right, uh, or wrong, rather. Rescue with no arguments will ca capture a, uh, anything descended from standard error. This leaves out a whole slew of exceptions, and this is, this is a common like, uh, point of beginner confusion because uh, things like no memory error, things like no load error, not implemented error, and a whole bunch of others uh, will go flying right by a bare rescue. Uh, you can give you can give rescue just a name, but no class. It'll assign the exception the the, uh, the exception to that variable. You can of course supply a class to say what class of errors you want to catch. You can also supply a list of classes uh, to say uh, catch any of these. Now, when you look at the syntax of a rescue clause. Uh, it, it looks a little familiar. It looks kind of like um, it looks kind of like a case clause, right? Um, and this is not a coincidence. Ruby's logic for matching an exception with a class is actually very similar to its case matching uh, its, its case matching logic. Which, if you know how case works, it uses the three equals operator, you know, three equals in a row, to do its its matching. Uh, exceptions are matched the exact same way. This is interesting knowledge because it means that we could theoretically do uh, dynamic exception matchers, which aren't just classes, but which are you know which implement the, the three equals to do some interesting logic, and uh, and and just provide those instead of instead of classes. Now there's one little hiccup in this. Ruby has a kind of arbitrary requirement that whatever you pass to rescue must be a class or a module. It can't just be any arbitrary object. But as long as it's a class or a module, uh, it just has to implement the triples operator. So here's some code which generates an anonymous module and uh, and sticks a triples operator on it, which uh, which is based on some which is based on some uh, some pattern matching code, and it matches on on the message. And now we can say rescue errors with message and uh, rescue any error whose message, whose message matches that regular expression. 
Uh, we, there, we also have an insure clause, which is where we put code that will always be executed, whether an exception is raised or not. This is a good place to put cleanup code. Now, Les Hill has documented an interesting uh, corner case with insure. If you have an explicit return inside your, return, your insure clause and an exception is raised, that exception will be thrown away without a trace. Uh, it'll just it'll return normally. So probably a good idea to just avoid having explicit returns inside your insure clauses. Ruby is one of the few languages that gives us a retry capability. So uh, here's a really simple demonstration of retry. We define a tries counter, uh, then we, we increment it. We try to do some operation which may raise an exception. And, uh, and then in the rescue, we look at the tries counter. If it's under three, we try again. We try again by saying retry. And what that does is that throws execution back up to right after that, uh, that first begin block and, uh, and then tries again. And then after three tries, uh, this code gives up. Now, you could do the same thing uh, with, a, with an explicit loop for tries. But what I find is when I have code that I've already written, which hits some kind of external, buggy external service or something like that, and I realize after the fact that it's that this service that it's hitting is unreliable, it's often easier to put some retry logic in than to rewrite that code uh, with, a, with a loop. What happens when we raise an exception while handling another exception? Depends on how raise is called. So if you call it with, uh, with a brand new message, then uh, it, will, it will just substitute the new exception. The new exception will be raised, the old one will be thrown away. There is no way to get a uh, reference to the original exception. And this tends to complicate debugging a lot uh, because you'll, you'll trace back to the origin of an exception and then you'll disco discover that it was raised while handling another exception and you have no idea what that, that uh, original exception was. So please avoid doing this. Instead, use nested exceptions. A nested exception is simply an exception which carries with a reference to the original exception, if any. Ruby doesn't have these out of the box, but it's very, very easy to, to define your own. Here's, here's an example. It just uh, defines a, it has a slot in it for the original, and you can pass that original, in, that original error in when you're raising it. So um, we've, we've been a little bit clever, though, with this definition of, of a nested exception, because if you look at the second example, we're raising, we're raising the, a, second ex, uh, a second error but we're not explicitly providing the original to it. But it'll actually pick up the original anyway. And the way it does that is we've said that the default value for that original attribute is dollar bang. It's the error info variable, which, as you recall, it always holds a reference to the currently active exception. So this way, it kind of mag you know, magically picks up from the environment the exception that was active when it was raised. You can re-raise, uh, you can re simply re-raise the exception that you rescued. This will throw the exact same object um, up the call stack without changing it in any way. You can supply a, uh, a new method. You can supply the original exception and a new message. And this actually creates a new exception object. It doesn't set the message. Uh, it just creates a new exception object, but it duplicates that old object. So any kind of state that the old object had with it is going to be is going to be duplicated and copied. It just uh, changes the message on the new one. This is actually kind of useful. Uh, so imagine a case where you have a data file and you're loading some data in by it's it, the data file is just lines of Ruby code and you're loading it by going going through the file line by line, evaluating the line and assigning the result to to an array index. Let's say there's a syntax error somewhere in that file. Here's the here's the error you get. It says compile you know syntax error. Compile error, uh, and it's just it's just pointing to the first line of that eval statement. No idea where in the actual data file that syntax error is. But what we can do is we can wrap that that eval in some exception handling code, which will it'll rescue any any exception, and then it will use this ability to rewrite the message to add some contextual information. So in this case, we're adding the path and the line number of the file uh, where that, that error occurred. And then 
just and then it rewrites the exception, but with a new message. Um, question? What's that? That's a good point. Uh, so, so in this particular in this particular case, yes, you could you, you could pass the the line number uh, and to uh, to eval and, and it would accomplish the same goal. However, um, so so that so that's for this case. But for in general, um, if you have if you have code, um, you know, where a low level exception may bubble out, and you have the ability to at a higher level to attach extra context, which will make debugging that error. Um, easier than uh, this is a, a handy technique. Uh, you can also, if you need to, you can rewrite the um, the backtrace uh, when you rewrite. This is probably an error, a good area to tread lightly, though. <clears throat> if you rewrite, if you call raise inside a rescue with no arguments whatsoever, it's just going to re-raise the currently active exception. Uh, now some languages don't allow any of this. Some languages you just can't you can't raise during a during handling another exception. And there are some there are some good reasons for this. I mean, um, you know, as, as we've as we've seen, sometimes ra sometimes raising during a, a rescue can complicate debugging. Uh, it can also result in resources not being properly cleaned up. If we wanted to, uh, we'd have some more fun with overriding rays in Ruby, and we could define a rays which does not um, which does not allow re-raising within a rescue. And uh, here's how we use it. So we can include it into object, and uh, when we try to raise a second error while rescuing a first error, it just ends the program. Um, however, what we've also done is we provided a, an error handled method where we can signal that yes, you know, explicitly that yes, we have handled it, and now we're raising a new one. And what this does is it just sets that error info uh, variable back to nil, so it is, it is mutable, and uh, and then it continues on. If an exception is not rescued in Ruby, eventually it'll bubble up to the top of the call stack, and Ruby will will cause the program to exit. Um, however, uh, it won't do this until it has executed various exit handlers. Uh, so I'm not going to go over the, the details and the differences between trap and add exit and end. Uh, but the point is, all these things can be will be called uh, before the program actually exits, even in the case of exiting due to an exception. And, and this is kind of handy. Um, if you ever had an application where you wanted to put some crash logging in it. You wanted to log um, unhandled exceptions, but you didn't. There, for, for whatever reason, there it was not easy to wrap the entire application in a big begin, rescue, end block. We can still tag on a uh, a crash logger without having to wrap the whole application. We can do this by finding an add exit block. So that'll be that'll be executed at the when the program exits, and we can use that that handy dandy error info variable to check to see if the program is exiting because of an error. And if it's exiting because of an error, we write out, we write out some information to a log file here, so we're writing out some information about the error. And in this case, we're also writing out the versions of all the Ruby gems that were loaded at the time of the error. I'm sure you can think of lots of other things you could throw in a, in a, a, a log file of that nature. All right, so that's that's the mechanics. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we respond to failures in programs. One way to respond to failure is simply uh, to return some sort of error value in Ruby programs. More often than not, this error value is is simply nil. Uh, a, a related approach, uh, which can sometimes uh, work better, is to return some kind of benign value. So you return something which more or less behaves like the object that was expected out of that method, uh, expected as the return value, but it just has some placeholder values. And, uh, and this is useful sometimes uh, when you don't want to when you don't want to force the caller to check the return value. Uh, maybe the maybe the method isn't you know too vital, and you don't want to bring down the program because it, because it failed. Uh, you may find yourself uh, wanting to log. Exceptions to some kind of uh, some kind of external service. You might want to log them to a file. You might want to log them to an external service. Uh, I think I forgot.
that's what we write hot code as, as, uh, as air brake. But, um, and this is, this is a, a great thing to do, but you need to be careful that you don't make things worse when you do this. So I'll tell you a little story about this. Um, I worked on a project once where we had a bunch of, we had a, a distributed cloud, uh, we had, we had you know, some master systems, and then we had queues, and we had lots of workers pulling jobs off the queues and, and processing them. And sometimes the, the jobs would fail. And we had written a little really basic uh, error reporting system, which would just email. So we'd use our Gmail account to send us an email with the error information, and then, the, it, you know, and then the, it would take the next job off the queue and keep going. So this worked okay. Uh, but one day, we rolled out uh, an update which caused the number of failed jobs to go up quite a bit. And so suddenly we're getting you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of error reports. And as a matter of fact, we got so many error reports going out to our Gmail account that uh, Gmail throttled our Gmail account. And the result of this was, um, the result of this in the code was Exceptions. It was uh, SMTP exceptions being raised. And that code had never been written to anticipate SMTP exceptions. And so, as a result, the workers instead of instead of reporting the error and then moving on to the next job, they would simply fall over and die because the the exception would, would bubble up and kill the whole worker. But that wasn't the worst of it. So we had workers dying, but that wasn't the worst. We had other systems, unrelated systems, that also reported their status using our Gmail account. And so they were emailing us, and then they hadn't been written to handle SMTP exceptions either, and so they were falling over and dying too. So we had completely unrelated services to these workers falling over and dying because we had failed to isolate our, our exception handling code. So it's just something to be aware of. Uh, one strategy for dealing with this, this tendency of failures to multiply like this uh, is the, the circuit breaker pattern, which uh, Michael Nygaard describes in his wonderful, wonderful book, Release It. I don't have time to go over the pattern in detail, but I do recommend that if you have uh, distributed systems like this, you check that out. Let's talk a little bit about how you structure uh, your failure handling strategy in your libraries or applications. First of all, when, how do you make the decision to raise an exception versus um, versus doing handling the error some other way. The uh, the, the simplest the simplest rule for this, um, but but one of the harder ones to interpret is well, exceptions should be exceptional. You know, only raise exceptions for truly exceptional cases. But this can be a little bit hard to it can sometimes be a little bit hard to decide. What warrants an exception? What doesn't? Um, one thing that is not that I don't think is exceptional is invalid user input. Humans make mistakes. They fat finger keyboards. They misunderstand uh, UIs. So I think uh, you know I used to I used to look at Active Record and see how it would not you know by default when you call raise it doesn't or when you call save sorry uh, it doesn't raise an exception uh, if the data is invalid. And I used to think that doesn't seem right. That's not like pure OO. Uh, correct, and then I thought about it some more, and I realized invalid data in that context, in the context of, of like a web form, is not unexpected. This is not an unexpected circumstance. So I, these days, I actually think it does the right thing because because that's an expected <coughs> thing to happen, um, and and so it actually kind of makes sense that that save does not raise an exception. Um, if you have a case where you really do want to break out of multiple levels of execution the way an exception does, but it is not an exceptional case, it's not an unexpected case. Ruby actually has, has a construct just for that. It's called throw and catch. And a lot of people coming into Ruby get that kind of confused with the raise and rescue. Um, but this gives us a way that is not part of the exception system at all to, to bomb out of a piece of code and, and, and go up to a higher level. Um, you can see an example of this in Sinatra. So Sinatra, you can say last modified in, in an action, and it'll check to see if the browser has the latest version of, of the, the, the page that it's serving. And if so, it'll just stop right there. No more of that action will be, will be executed. And the way that's implemented is it throws 
the halt symbol up the call chain, and then a uh, middleware that's higher up the call chain catches that halt symbol and uh, and ends the request right there. So it, it avoids any expensive processing that might have been further down the action. Another question to ask yourself, am I prepared to end the program? Any exception, not handled, can end the program, or in a, the case of an application server, can at least end the request. And sometimes it's just looking at it from this perspective, just looking at it from the perspective of, do I, am I prepared to end the program over this, can change your, your, your way of thinking about a particular case. And you can think, you know what, that case actually is a, it's a secondary functionality. Maybe we should just fall back in some way and not actually, uh, not actually raise an exception there. Question number three that I'd like to ask is, can I punt the decision somewhere else? So this, this question of what constitutes an exception continually plagues us in, in programming. And, and you know, you can ask, uh, is an end of file a failure? Is a missing, missing hash key a failure? Is a 404 from some web service a failure? Um, and the, the answer to all of those is it depends. It depends on the context, it depends on the circumstance. But when you raise an exception, you force the issue. You say, I know that this case is unexpected. I know that this case is, is exceptional. Um, and particularly when you do that in library code, sometimes um, you can be kind of asserting an opinion which, which may not map to reality. So whenever I have a case like this uh, where I'm really not sure of what decision to make, I like to find, see if there's a way I can punt the decision somewhere else. And um, and you can do this in Ruby. And an example of this that I really like is the fetch method uh, that a lot of the Ru that arrays and hashes and a lot of the Ruby uh, containers have, where you can specify a fallback action or a fallback value uh, if the key that it's looking for is not found. And so, for an optional key, we could specify just a default value that it'll fall back to. For a required key in a hash, we could specify instead of a default value, we can say raise, uh, raise some exception. And, uh, and this way, the caller decides on a case-by-case -case basis uh, whether that missing key represent, represents an unexpected case or just a, uh, an ordinary expected case. Uh, and we can do this in our own code. It's very sim simple to do this kind of fallback action where we, uh, we take a block and we let the caller, we pump that decision up to the caller. The caller decides uh, how to handle the case where, uh, you know, where where a value is missing or something didn't work. Question number four. Am I, am I throwing away valuable diagnostics? So, um, this, is, so this is the case, with, for example, where you have some process that, that you know, maybe you're provisioning a server or something. It takes 15 minutes um, and accumulates all kinds of context along the way and all kinds of logs. And, uh, and, and objects are created, and then one trivial little error causes an exception to be raised, and it blows up through the call stack and throws away all that contextual information, cleans it up, and, and you're left with a uh, very little idea of what was actually going on at the time that the exception was raised, and you also don't have any kind of intermediate output or anything like that. So this is a case where it might make sense not to raise an exception. It might make sense to have just some kind of, some way of collecting uh, error flags or, or error info uh, along the way. Uh, finally, uh, a last question I'd like to ask is, would continuing forward result in a less informative exception? So sometimes, I mean, uh, particularly uh, when you, you're, like, when you have input to a method, you have a case where, where it's just, you know, uh, certain values are simply unacceptable. So, uh, maybe a, like a, a nil value for an argument is, is not acceptable. And if you let it proceed further down into that method, it might raise an exception which is pretty inscrutable. Uh, but if you catch it uh, right at the top there, if you raise an exception right at the top there with the guard clause, you can, uh, you can be a lot friendlier to, to the caller. So that's a, that's a case for failing early. In my code, I like to, uh, as much as possible, isolate the exception handling code from the mainline business logic. Um, if you, you've probably seen some code that looks like this, maybe um, you've seen code that looks like this only times 10, so where you have 
uh, begin rescue, and then inside that there's another case that's begin rescue, and then inside that there's another another case. All these things that could go wrong, and it tends to make the code really hard to follow because you're you're mixing up the, the business logic with all these sort of tan all these sort of tangents on and oh if this goes wrong we have to do this and oh if this goes wrong we have to do this. Uh, very hard to follow that kind of logic. Also, in my experience, code like that tends to be um, tends to be bug ridden and hard to debug. Um, I've actually started thinking of the begin keyword in Ruby as kind of a code smell because Ruby gives us this neat, um, this neat syntactical idiom where if you only have one level of failure handling in your method, uh, just, just the top level of failure, failure handling, you can leave out the begin clause. And you can just have beginning, big, beginning of your method, and then you can have rescue, uh, and then if you want you can have ensure, and then you can have end. And so what that does, I, I like this because it, it kind of neatly divides the method into sections. You say, here's our, here's our mainline business logic up to this point. Below this, this is, all, this is all error handling. And then, if needed, below this, this is house cleaning. Um, and it's, it's really nice division. Um, and I think it, it makes code, code easier to follow. And it, it tends to, to result in, in better factor code, too. Uh, if you're trying to move code in this direction, one thing you can do is use something I call a contingency method. So let's say you have, let's say you have uh, some code that does a lot of I.O. And every single time you do an I.O. operation, you wrap it with uh, begin rescue end, where you rescue I.O. error, or you rescue system call error. And, uh, and you, you handle it pretty much the same way every time. Uh, but each time you do some I.O., you have to wrap it with that, because you know sometimes this is going to fail. Uh, what you can do is you can factor those begin rescue ends out into a contingency method whose only responsibility is implementing your failure handling policy for that code. And so now you've, you've got, you've kind of separated things out into business logic and IO failure handling policy. And you can now change those independently. Um, and uh, I think it reads a lot cleaner as well. Pop quiz. What parts of this code can raise an exception? Just yell it out. Uh, that's right, all of it. The answer is all of it. Because in Ruby there's no, there are certain exceptions which can be raised at any point in the code. So things like no memory error, if you run out of memory, that's going to be, that can be raised anywhere. Um, signal exception, somebody presses control C on the keyboard, that signal exception can pop up anywhere. And um, this is a little scary uh, because sometimes we have methods which are kind of important and we don't, you know, methods like that, like, especially like exception reporting methods, that we really, uh, we don't want them to, to mess things up further when exception is raised. Um, so critical methods need known exception semantics. And, um, and there is actually kind of a, uh, there's a, there's an old, um, there's an old list of, of guarantees. This has been around for a while. I came across it in the, in the C++ community uh, that kind of divides up the, the different uh, levels of exception safety that a method can have. So you start at the lowest level, you start with the weak guarantee, which just says uh, we, this method promises that the object will be left in a consistent state if an exception is raised. It might be a different state, but it would at least be a consistent state. It won't have like null pointers or something like that. Uh, then you have a strong guarantee, which is basically a rollback guarantee. It says the object will be rolled back to its beginning state if an exception is raised. And finally, strongest guarantee is the no-throw guarantee, where you say, I promise no exception will be raised from this method. It is useful, at least when thinking about some of your more critical methods, to you know, think about them in light of these three guarantees and, and think, you know, what, what guarantee should this method uh, try to try to promise? And, and then think about, you know, how, what can I do to ensure that, that, that it is actually guaranteeing that. Uh, there are some automated methods for verifying your, uh, your exception guarantees and verifying the method actually does implement the strong guarantee and stuff like that. But unfortunately, I don't have time to go over them uh, in this talk. Here's an anti-pattern. Sometimes you encounter some code that just raises some like client uh, library code or something that just raises all kinds of exceptions. 
uh, with no rhyme or reason, and you finally just wind up wrapping the thing in rescue exception and, uh, and throwing every exception away. Unfortunately, this, sort of, this is a huge source of bugs. I can't tell you how many times I have debug situations where it turned out that the reason things, were, uh, things weren't working right, or, or failing to fail properly even, it was because they, um, they did one of these. They just threw away all exceptions. Um, if, if because of the way the code that you're, you're wrapping is written, you can't, guarantee, you can't rely on any particular exception class being raised, uh, if nothing else, try and match on the error message. And, uh, and that way you can maybe limit some of those, uh, some of those surprises. When you're writing library code, um, you're, there's kind of a conundrum around how to structure the exceptions that come out of your library code. Because on the one hand, it, it would be nice if you could just raise, uh, you know, if you have an IO error, people expect an IO error. If you have a system, you know, and, and Ruby has sort of built-in argument errors. Um, range errors, things like that. Ruby has these nice built-in error classes that people understand, uh, and people you know know how to how to know about them and know how to deal with them. So it'd be nice to be able to raise these sort of classic Ruby exceptions. But on the other hand, it would also be nice to be able to say all of my exceptions inherit from this one library exception class, and that way you know, and if you're using my library, you know you can just rescue that one exception class, and they will all be caught. And so these these two things seem kind of at odds with each other. But um, there's actually a way to, to resolve that. So uh, and, and it's using something that, that I'm, I'm referring to as module tagging. So what you can do is you can define a module whose only job is to act as kind of a type tag. Uh, it doesn't actually have to contain anything. It's just a type tag. And what you do is, is at the top level of your library, you just wrap, you, you wrap your code in clauses that look like this, where you rescue any exception that comes out, and you tag it with that module. That module you just extend it, dynamically extend it with that module, and then you rewrite it. And that way, uh, your client code uh, can kind of have its cake and eat it too. It can it can choose to either rescue specific exceptions, you know, uh, ranger, um, or uh, or it can um, uh, or it can rescue your sort of global uh, library exception. Uh, I will, uh, I'm going to get to some question time uh, shortly. One of the, the um, questions, the, the big questions that I've sort of gone through in every project or, that I've done is how do I structure my exception hierarchy? And there are a lot of ways you could go about this. You could, you could base your structures on the your, your exceptions on the module that they come from. So if you have different software modules, you can say, you know, this module has its own exception class, and this module has its own exception class. Uh, you can base them uh, more vertically. You can base them on like the layer that an exception comes out of. So you can say you can have your low-level exceptions and your high-level exceptions. Um, you can even do it by severity if you wanted to. Uh, and and this has sort of bugged me. Every time I've done a project, it feels like I make the same decision uh, over again. And I'm never, never quite sure if I, if I made the right decision. Uh, but what I've started to do recently is I've started, instead of looking at it um, from the point of view of the architecture of the program, I've started to look at it from the point of view of, of the, the end result. Why do we break down our exception classes at all? Why do we raise, why do we raise different exception classes? Why don't we just raise runtime error all the time? Uh, well, one reason is we might want to tag some some special information onto an exception. But the biggest reason is so that we can structure our rescues to, to rescue different types of exception differently. And so I've started to sort of look at things backwards and, and work backwards and say, um, what are the actual, what are the ways that, that exceptions um, are handled differently? So what different ways do we, do we typically uh, see exceptions handled? And I, I've, in, in a lot of apps, they basically break down into three categories, I find. So you have your, your uh, user error. Um, user error, like you know, a 404, uh, 404 page, or 403, 403 page, or an invalid data, or something like that. But user error says um, you, have, you have done something wrong. You have used the system wrong. The only way that you can address it is by changing what you, what you did and trying again. Uh, then you have another category of logic errors where the message there is 
we had done something wrong, and there was absolutely nothing you can do about it except maybe report a bug. And finally, you see your, your transient errors, which says, uh, you didn't do anything wrong, and our code isn't broken, uh, but we're just experiencing heavy load, or we're doing some maintenance or something like that. And so what you can do uh, is you can wait and try again later. And so you, you, sort, of, you sort of see this, this breakdown along the lines of what the user, how the user, whether the user is a, is a human or whether it's client code, should, um, should respond. And when you work backwards from that, you come up with three basic exception classes, uh, user error, logic error, and transient error. And I've started to, to break my exception hierarchies down uh, into these classes. And, and in my experience, I think it, 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 uh, it captures the important differences uh, between exceptions in most cases. All right, uh, so I thought of trying to summarize all that, um, but there's no way. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you got something uh, from, from part of that talk. Uh, hopefully you learned something new. Um, uh, when I was putting together a talk about exceptions, I discovered I had so much material I couldn't possibly fit it all in the talk, so I wrote a book. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a discount code you can use. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much.